Well, we're doing one last um, lecture on MapReduce, and so I'll just quickly review that as people are coming in. Um, um, so if you remember, there's going to be some large, large data set, and it's going to be somehow partitioned into these um, partitioned into pieces. Each, each of the pieces um, is going to be described as a set of these key value pairs. And so, um, and each of the, the chunks is going to be replicated on disk. And, and to start off, you don't have a um, control over, say, much control over which uh, you, you want to make it depend, so you can have arbitrary placement of the key value pairs in each of the chunks, and each chunk you don't control over which chunk is on the same machine. Um, so, so then you want to do two, just two steps. The map step is going to take every key value pair um, and it's going to output a set of these key value pairs and then to reduce that is going to take in um, one particular key and then all of the values associated um, with it and it's going to output some other set of these um, all of these key value pairs and there's this magic shuffle step in between here which is taking the output of this large set of key value pairs and somehow um, getting all the keys, all the key value pairs with the same key on the same machine so that you have all the values and you can do some operation. So this, this match step is, 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 is uh, how you construct the locality of your data so you can operate on things. Um, and so there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that makes sure if, um, if certain nodes uh, fail that it'll just route the operation of a certain reducer to a, um, into a different node. And we'll try and do the load balancing and stuff all behind the scenes. So you just have to write these simple map and reduce operation. And each of this is a round, and you want um, a, a constant um, number of rounds. OK. Um, so hopefully, by now, everyone's familiar with this. Why are we saying that the map set only reads one key value? It will only read one key value at a, time. at a time. Oh, OK. So it has to have a, an operation that it runs on every key value inherent individually. It's not going to look at it as, as, a, as a set. Okay. If you want a lot of is, is the set often of size 1? At least that's the picture I've had so far about The output values. or here? The yeah. output set. The, the output set could be, it could be sometimes it's size 1. Sometimes you want to replicate things. Like, remember when key value pair was an edge, then we we signed the key. We had two outputs where one key was one vertex and the other key was the other vertex. Um, yeah, so that we're doing the last day of MapReduce, and then next week we'll talk about GPUs, and then we'll have like two weeks to do other sort of uh, large-scale distributed algorithms, kind of a hot for you different, um, a different type. Um, okay, so what are we talking about today? Is called um, minimal um, MapReduce um, uh, minimal MapReduce algorithms, and so this is from these are from a paper. Um, from Tao, um, I think, Tao, Lin, and Zhao in uh, 2013, so it just came out this summer. Um, and so it, it defines, we, we've looked at these models of, operate, of computation that we, that we worked on for MapReduce, and this is a, a little bit further restriction of this, and it shows that you can still uh, design a lot of algorithms of, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a large set of algorithms that we can do within this even more restricted model. Um, okay, so, so it says that um, n is going to be um, this 
the size of the, of the data. So this is the size of all the sets. And then we're going to have, um, we're also going to take into consideration um, the number of machines. Um, before, we just kind of assumed that we had some bounded but really large number of machines and we would use as many as we needed. But if we didn't want to, um, but if we didn't, uh, um, but if we only wanted to split it by 10 ways and we had 100 machines, then 90 of them were not being used. Now we're going to say we have T machines, we're going to try and use all the machines. And then M is going to be a parameter which is N over T. Right, so this is, if I split all of my data T ways, that this is some value M. Okay, and so in, in general before we had this parameter big M, which was the size of the memory. Um, this is the size of mem on one machine. And so this value has to be smaller um, in order for this to make sense, right? The, this small m needs to be smaller than the big M, which hopefully that's why it's a small m. Um, right, uh, okay, so now we're going to have, given these parameters, we're going to have um, four properties that we have for an algorithm for it needs to be minimal. And I'll write them down and then I'll discuss kind of the implications of these. Um, so um, at all times, each machine has O of M um, data. Right, so, so, so no machine has more than a T fraction of all the data at, at any time up to some constant. We can be off by maybe a factor of two or three or something like that. Um, so two is that um, each round, um, each um, machine sends and receives All of them, um, so it, it's it's sending and receiving all of that. So it can't it can't get more than fits in its memory, um, and it can't send more than that either. So we're not going to have one machine that has m things send out m squared things. It can't duplicate everything because that would take that one machine too long. Um, and then, so it has a um, a constant number of rounds, which is great. There's overhead with rounds, so you want to keep it a constant. And um, that the um, um, the total time, so, so now we're actually going to measure the runtime on each machine in addition, is going to be um, it's going to be equal to O of the T sequential, which is the sequential time, if I were to run this in the same algorithm in RAM, say I could fit everything in memory, then the sequential time over T. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually saving in time by factor T the number of machines I have, right? So I'm actually getting a factor T speed up with T machines, which is as good as you can possibly do. So you, you can't do better than this, and we're, so we're achieving the optimal speed. Okay. Um, is, the, is the assumption for uh, we want to get the two? If you satisfy all four of these properties, then this is called a minimal map reduce algorithm. So, so we want to try and um, you know satisfy all of these. So in the in the, some of the algorithms we looked at in the past have not satisfied. They need to do some sort of uh, duplication. So maybe one machine was sending more than O of M uh, data off of it. Right, because everything it had it was, you know, if it had um, m things, it was sending out m squared things because it was replicating some stuff. That would not be allowed. So, uh, or maybe some machines, if you're not careful, have, have too much data. Right. So, so, so it, if you look at if you look at this one, um, so the, this the, this will ensure that. 
you have um, no um, data skew. Right? So you, you're not going to have this issue where one machine has way more information than all the other machines. Right? And you're not going to have to wait for this one machine to, to take that much longer, because all the machines are going to have roughly the same amount of memory. Um, and so, um, so, so it, it also is important that, um, so because, you know, I'm, my input is actually the size of the data in T, right, M is derived from N and T. So I can scale, scale to any um, number of machines. Right, so, so I'm not restricted by something artificial to problem. I can only use 10 or 100 machines. I can use 1,000 machines or 10,000 machines. Right, and you know, inside like inside Google, people are can run versions of MapReduce on on you know 10,000 machines. You want to be able to do this. So th these algorithms, you know, if you have more data, you can just use more machines, um, which which is great. And then. You don't have to worry about the machine's failure because the MapReduce will handle all that, all, all, all that backend. Um, so, how well does Map and Produce uh, react to catastrophic failure? Like uh, somebody pulls the breaker that disconnects all of the machines. So all of the machines, there's nothing you can do. There, if you read the original MapReduce paper, they they run a job where something like 95% of the machines went down and it's still finished. Um, it took longer, right? You're, yeah. <laughs> you're only at five percent of your machine still running, so it's going to take, you know, twenty times longer than it would have otherwise probably. But it's still finished. Um, so that's kind of the. So it's. So it's. I'm not sure how long it actually takes. It kind of when a lot of the reducers start to finish, it'll start pinging the machines that are still running, and if they don't respond, it'll reassign the job. So. Probably on the order of two or three times when you would expect okay. it would start to start to be able to um, figure out machines are okay. Right. But in the event of a catastrophic failure, you probably would have to start over. It's not like you could just. It's not like you would just have to go back to the beginning of the current if, round. If all of your machines start out running, then your job is not going to finish. Well, yeah. I, <laughs> right. Um, I'm picturing all of the machines go down. Somebody finds the problem and gets them all back up. Do we have to just repeat the current round, or do we have to go back to the start? Well, okay. So and, and if you don't so, know, it's okay. So, so, so probably how they do this in the company is in, inside, of, say, Google, someplace. They would maybe all the machines in one room went down. And they say, okay, if the data is also is only stored on those machines, then you have to wait. If it's also replicated on machines in another room, then you run it on the machines in another room, and someone boots those machines up over the next day. Right? Um, you know, you, you one of the reasons for replication is so that if everything goes down in one area, you have it someplace else that you can use it. Um, so, so it's. It, it, sh it should be the whole system designed to be extremely tolerant to these things. The, it's not a des designed to be extremely efficient to uh, to like get queries back, you know, you know, instantaneously necessarily. Um, it's going to build structures that allow you to do that. Say, it'll build an inverted index, which will allow you to ask Google search queries really quickly. But it's running. It builds that in the background, which it can spend a lot of time doing. But it will make sure it always gets done. Okay. Um, so um, the, the the other important thing of this send and receive and all the nodes, um, this point two, is that this ensures that the algorithm is going to be stateless. Right. So so this is this is important because if one machine, no one machine is really taking too much time or is doing too much of the burden of the computation. So if that machine goes down, then the data is, should be replicated someplace else, and it can, it, can, it, it, it can reproduce it. If one machine is taking too long because it's not down, but it's just slow, then you can do, um, 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 then you can do load balancing. So also you could say, you could design an algorithm, well, let's say I had only, um, um, I only had 100 machines, 
But some of them I know are going to be running slower than other ones, but I don't know which ones. So I designed a job with t equals to, say, 500. So now each machine will have roughly five jobs. Well, if one machine is five times slower, then maybe it will finish the first job, the master node will realize that this machine is really slow, and it will assign the other four jobs to machines which are not slow. So you can, you can increase, artificially increase this t and, um, and kind of deal with the variability in the, in the, in the number of, in the speed of the individual machines. Um, so, and then, you know, this third one is, is for practicality. You don't want it to take too long. And the fourth one is also important because, you know, th this is going to be somewhat proportional to the total amount of, of energy that's used in the system. And so, um, so, so it, th th this means that you're using no more uh, CPU power um, than if you were just running sequentially on one machine. So you can get the speed up without using more power. You're just disturbing it across machines to get it faster. Right, so, the, so, so this means, you know, um, this is power efficient as well. Okay. So, the, the, you know, the, this, the fact that you restrict the memory to be a function of your machines is kind of an added, um, a, a, an added restriction on top of the other arguments we talked about. Either m was some sort of parameter, or it was set to be n to the one minus epsilon, and things kind of worked. And we also are ensuring this this, uh, this total runtime time as well. Uh, so, if uh, there was only one machine, and uh, the time taken is t sequential, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. But the power consume in both the cases would be the same, right? Because here t machines, small t machines are taking uh, t sequence by t time. Like as per the last statement. Yeah, that's right. Right. So the total power is going to be the same. We're yes. going to uh, spend t t over t sequential time over the number of machines on each machine. So you, the total amount of power used is still is going to be the same as before. So you're not, you're, you're not improving this at all, but you're not wasting power. Okay, so that's why it is power efficient. Yeah, since yeah. we are not wasting. Right. You're getting the speed up without wasting power. Okay. So. This, this O of M send from each machine also ensures that the total amount of information sent over the entire, as well as the constant number of rounds, ensures that the total number of amount of information sent is actually O of, o of N. So also you have O of N um, you know, um, data transfer. So the, 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 the data transfer is actually one of one of the bottlenecks for the power consumption as well, and so I guess sequentially you don't necessarily have to transfer the data, um, but you're you're not transferring more than the than the data have. You're not doing n squared data transfer. Um, okay, so all right, so let's look at some some algorithms, and so we'll start. Um, by looking at, at sorting. And let me start by backing up with, 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 uh, with this story of one of the reasons that Hadoop got a lot of attention. Um, there was this benchmark um, called Terrasort. Um, and, and the basic idea was um, um, how fast can you um, sort one um, terabyte of data? Okay, and there are restrictions that each had to be an, an integer taking so many bytes. You couldn't just have like one really long piece of information that's already sorted. Right? So they're, they, kind of, they kind of set this thing up. And the interesting thing of this, this TerraSort benchmark is that they said, I don't care what machines you use or how many you use. Use as many as you can. And so back in the 2000s, you know, it was a struggle to use hundreds of machines to keep them all up, up and running. It was uh, um, machines would go down, and then the data that you were sorting on those machines, you had to keep track of. You had to do benchmarking and so forth. And so, um, so in in 2009. Um, 
um, there is there's a, a Hadoop implementation of sorting, um, which sorted a terabyte of data in roughly uh, 1.5 minutes. Um, and this, and their kind of challenge is how much data could you sort in a minute, and they basically got to a terabyte data sort in a minute. Um, they didn't quite do it in one minute, they only did like 500 gigabytes in a minute, but it was, it was roughly a minute. Before, they're only able to get like two, 200, uh, like 200 gigabytes. And this was on a set of these big iron boxes, these really powerful, but a much smaller number of machines. I think they did this with, uh, so, so this was this, uh, 10 to the 12 bytes. Um, and this. Oh, they're one byte integers. Yeah, I think they were. There's something like as opposed to one trillion four byte integers. You can't do you can't do just one byte integers because then there's not enough uh, dip distinct numbers. I think so. They, they there's some restriction. I forget. Maybe it's like a hundred byte integers or something. Or I, I guess the first. I think the first ten bytes are an ID, and then the maybe the first twelve. All bytes are an ID or something, and then the rest of them are actually describing what the value is. Um, okay, so then, uh, so is it a, was it a trillion bytes of data then, or a trillion of these integers? Well, uh, so I, I I think it was um, like ten million integers. Okay. But they, they, were, they were long ints or something. And there were there were like 100 bytes per per element you were sorting. Yeah, so if you look in the, the notes I posted online, I linked to the web page for this sort benchmark.org and it lists a bunch of the details about this. Um, so so this, so but this Hadoop system worked with uh, you know it did 1.5 minutes. I used something like 35,000. Um, machines, and the previous, the previous best, best, uh, best approach for this had done, had had gotten there using something like uh, um, a few hundred machines, but much more powerful machines, right? Th th this was able to do this very quickly across 3,500 machines, which is you know is really a lot. Um, so, oh wait, this was no, this was only 14, about 1,400. The same, at the same time, they, they sorted um, 100 terabytes in roughly one um, terabyte a minute. Um, and th this was on um, um, 3,500 machines. So uh, up until this point, roughly the challenge was how fast can you sort this one terabyte? After this, people said, "Okay, you know, in order to problem solve, let's go to the next one." Well, let's let's solve it. You have to break this. You need to sort, you know, 100 terabytes now because this is now capable, and you want to measure the terabyte sorted per minute of at least 100 terabytes. And so, th this record has been broken um, by maybe factor two or three at this point. The speed, um, but they're they're using the the algorithm that they're using is going to be very similar to what we'll talk about. But Hadoop was the first system stable enough to really reach reach these speeds, and, and the scale and able to make it to be done uh, possible. Yeah. Should we infer that Google's MapReduce could probably could have done it sooner, but they just weren't making their thing available? That's for, so. that's quite possible. We could easily speculate that. Um, okay. So so how does how does this how does this algorithm work? Um, Oh, so so I, I listened to a talk where the guy talked yeah. about this, and he said that because um, they had to buy so many machines, um, they didn't want to spend a lot of money, and so they bought like cheap parts. And then they found out what the difference is between buying cheap hard drive is versus an enterprise hard drive. And because they had so many problems with it, there was like some grad student, and like all they would do is he would just sit um, like throughout the night, and he'd push play, and then it would sort, and almost like a lot often. There would be 
some bits would flip on, on the hard drive. Yeah. And so they'd have to redo the whole experiment because it was... Oh, because too many it, bits would flip. Because it was, yeah, because it, it was faulty data because yeah, yeah. they weren't using very good hard drives. And so, um, so, that, so it, it wasn't, you know, like, to sort the large amount of data, they had to redo it okay. several times. It wasn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, weren't always able to successfully sort it. But that was, so yeah. that teaches you that, you know, buying expensive hardware does have its advantages. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's true. Yeah, it's, it's hard to verify if it's uh, as well. So, like without, you can check if something, if the sorting has gone bad, but you can't say, okay, I can just fix this one thing now that I've done it. It becomes uh, kind, of, kind of tricky, so. Um, or it's very expensive to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you, could, you could write data out, well, write multiple data copies of the data out on, uh, on the same node and stuff to try and guard against that. But uh, at some point, your I/O throughput starts going. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's doing it, it's doing some of this. Every end of the round, it's going to be writing stuff. It's writing stuff back out to disk. So, and it's and it's ensuring at the end of every round that things are are replicated. So some of this is going on in, in the background, but to a, to a custom. Um, okay, so. How's, how's this algorithm work? Um, so it's going to set a parameter um, k, and we'll say um, in, in this paper it claims that k is going to be t times the natural log of n t. I, I suspect in practice, um, I, I, I'm not confident, I, I think maybe it should be, actually this needs to be t squared natural log of n. Um, but I'll, I'll present what's in the, in the paper. So I need to, one of my friends is a co-author, I, I need to ask him if this is something about the proof. But, um, okay, so you have some parameter k. Um, and then we're going to do this only in two rounds. And the first round will be kind of a faster round. Um, so, so map one, what is it going to do? It's going to, um, um, for all s in the set, um, so with, um, with probability um, uh, with probability k over n, it's going to um, send um, it's going to send s to j different machines. So this is for one um, for all s with can't read your next word uh, with probability or k over n. Okay, it's going to send this s to all the machines. Um, okay, reduce two. Um, so, so each machine now is going to do exactly the same thing. Um, and you could do it only on, on one machine, but then you're going to need another round to kind of, or somehow to cheat to actually how to send this. Um, so, you, so on each um, J, you're going to get um, J and then this set um, S1, S2, up to S roughly K. So you're going to get about K things, and we'll call this equal to um, B, this set B. So what it's then it's going to sort, um, it's going to sort B, and it's going to um, and then it's going to take um, t minus 1 evenly spaced um, um, elements. We'll call these b1, b2, up to b t minus 1. 
Okay, um, and so the goal is that you actually have this set um, S1, S2, this, this whole set up to S roughly K, and then you're going to have V1 in here, V2, and the gap between V1 and V2 is going to be um, it's going to be K over T. And this will be true between every pair of these breakpoints. And then we're going to insert these, these dummy ones. This is equal to negative infinity. And you're going to put the infinity of ET is equal, equal to infinity. So you're going to actually have T plus one of these breakpoints. Okay, so, so you're going to get a set of elements that are sent to every node, which is slightly larger than the number of machines. It's larger by, say, a factor log n, or maybe it's, t, it's a t factor larger. And then you're going to sort just these elements. These should be a, a pretty small number. Usually your machines is much smaller than your, your amount of data. And you're going to sort these, and then pick evenly spaced points as, as these breakpoints. Um, OK, so, so you're going to get, and these breakpoints are then going to kind of, it's, it's kind of like the splitters you're using if you're doing a, um, if you're doing a quick sort, but you're doing a T-way split now instead of a two-way split. So this will be kind of like this, the, this IOR efficient merge sort that, we, that, that we, we talked about, or the IOR efficient quick sort that we talked about. You're doing a T-way split to T different machines, okay? So now in... Okay, so we're not sending all of the data out. Right, we're only sending a pretty small amount of data. So uh, um, we're only sending k points, and k is is a function of the number of machines. It's um, and only logarithmically dependent on the amount of data. Here. So k should be much smaller than n. So what, what we want is that k is much smaller um, than. N. In fact. We need that k is equal to um, O of m. And O of m is just upper bound, it can be much smaller than m. Right, but you can fit each of these in, in one machine. Um, okay. um, so then, and then in the, in the map two, what we're going to do is for, um, all right, so um, for, each S in, in, the, in the set that you have, um, you, you're going to say if B J minus one is less than S is less or equal to B J, then I'm going to send, um, I'm basically going to send this value S to machine J, right? So these breakpoints tell me which machine to send it to. I find the largest, so the machines numbered one through t, the largest breakpoint, um, the, the, the smallest breakpoint which is larger, you know, that, that's gonna tell me which machines to do. So this I need to do some, this takes logarithmic time in the number of machines, which should be less than n. So, so, so I can send this to each machine. And now I have the right data on each machine. And then on um, reduce two, I'm I'm going to get in um, some set. We'll call this Q um, J is going to be as S1, S2. Is is all these things that fell between the two breakpoints, um, and I'm going to write out J times the sort. QJ. Okay, so it's a pretty simple algorithm. The first round, you're going to sample some things at random and send these out and use, and then from this slightly larger than the number of machines, sort these and get some breakpoints, and only T breakpoints, and these will tell me how to split my data. Then I'll split my data, um, then I'll use these breakpoints which are already in all the machines, or technically I need to write each of these out to 
um, each of the machines for the next round. Um, and, and then I'm going to use these to kind of distribute my data. And then once I've distributed, I just sort each other piece. And now I'm going to write it out in a way so I have a key which tells me the order that these different pieces are in. And this sort QJ is then this sort of thing. So I'm going to have T. My data is going to be broken into T blocks. I know the order of the blocks. And each of the blocks are in sorted order. This, uh, the principle overall looks like a B tree insertion. Right? B tree also, you have uh, certain boundaries in the non leaf nodes, like we have boundaries here. Yeah. And we just uh, find on which, uh, and, and out of all the boundaries, which boundary should be chosen so that on, you can insert on that page. Oh, that's right, that's right. This, this, this problem of finding good splitters um, of the data is a really, really important problem. And it's, it's useful in a lot of contexts. It's very important for, for B-trees. It's basically doing the same thing. How do you choose the splitters initially? If you have the data sorted, you can choose the optimal, the optimal split. So you have exactly the same thing in each block. Right? In a B-tree, you just want to maintain it so they're roughly the same. Here, we're gonna, I'm going to show that the splits are going to be roughly the right size in each of the machine. So the sorting in each machine is going to take the roughly amount of time. And it will satisfy these, these minimal mapping size levels. So th 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 this is, you know, you think sorting you takes, uh, you know, is, is going to take some large, some log -end, logarithmic number of rounds. You really need two rounds if you do it, if, if you do it correctly. Um, and so there have been, there have been, uh, Techniques that have beat this terror sort on, on Hadoop, but they basically used a very similar strategy to this. Um, uh, but they, what they've done is they've been a lot more careful about how the hardware was set up and how they sent the information in between the rounds. And uh, they kind of tweaked some things and they got a factor two or three speed up because of the, um, the, the inefficiencies built into it. Um, but, but, but this is the basic strategy for how, how the sorting works. All right, so, excuse me. Yeah. Why do we need to uh, take a T minus one uh, in every spray? Yeah, so it's why do we need T minus one? So, um, so I, I added in these two extra breakpoints, BT and B0. B0 is at minus infinity. It's smaller than any possible thing. So if I'm using integers, maybe this is going to, and they're all, maybe they're all positive integers, and this I can set to zero, right? Um, or I don't really need this. This is just for notation, and 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 this can be int max, right? So then I say I have a greater or equal, right? So, so then I can say now nothing is less than B0, and I have t machines. I find the largest breakpoint. I mean the smallest breakpoint, which is larger than my data. And there are T possible options for T machines. So that's why I need the T breakpoints. What is the uh, uh, or, sorry, go ahead. How does this algorithm react if the data is skewed? Like it turns out that ninety percent of the data is between two or three breakpoints. Well, so the key is I sh this random sampling should have chosen breakpoints. So it's going to be, it's, it's going, the breakpoints are going to be distributed with respect to the actual data. And so I need, to, I need to argue that that's Okay, the so case. they're not evenly spaced throughout the Yeah, case. I've selected them randomly. So this is a random sample. So this trick of randomly sampling things to split is, is very useful. If you don't, so before in the class we had talked about these other algorithms that were deterministic and had to do something like, um, uh, doing this linear time median finding algorithm, right? But, you know, th this is what you need to do in order to get something like quicksort to be guaranteed to work well, right? But does anyone ever use that for quicksort? Do you run the linear time median algorithm? No, you just pick a random thing and it does pretty well, right? Now, if you're just picking one random split, then one point should be fine. You're gonna get at least, you know, with high probability a good, um, pretty good split. But now I need t different splits. So I'm going to need an extra factor in the, in the number of things I need to pick. And then I'm going to, and, and I picked k different things. 
I don't want to split k waves. I only want to split t waves. Um, and so I can I can pick the t most evenly spread out split points among the k, and and that's and and that's why I need to use the um, and that's what I need to do in order to split. Right. So um, maybe let me draw maybe an illustration here. Right. So what's going on? So so S. So let's assume that that I don't know the order of S, but it's going to look like this set of points here, and there's some some ordering, and maybe there are gaps, right? So if, so some are more bunched up. Okay. So so this is my data, and then I've randomly sampled some k number of these items. And so pick this one. Okay, so now I've sampled k of these things. Let's say that k here was equal to uh, seven. Okay, and now I want to split into three into three pieces. So I'm going to choose two splitters. I'm going to choose. Um, so I'll choose this splitter, and I'll choose this splitter. And once I've, I've done that, so the gap is going to be two things, right? So maybe if I'd chosen, um, let's say instead, just so it, the numbers work out a little bit better, let's say I chose k equal to 8 and t equals to 3, and I have another guy here. Um, and now I chose these guys. So this now I have a I have a gap of two in between each of the splits I chose, right? So you can see when you randomly sample, you tend to get some things kind of kind of bunched up. You, you're going to get some things right next to each other. You're going to get some large gaps, right? This is going to happen. But if you oversample by a bit, then things are going to kind of kind of even out. Um, so I oversampled and then I re picked these guys. So if I just picked two things at random, it probably would not have been this good. So I, I oversampled by either a factor of log n t or maybe a factor t log n, depending on how you do the analysis, um, how the analysis works. And now these, so, so this one is going to be um, b1, and this is b2, and I'll put a fake b3 out here and a fake b0 out here. So then when I go back over my data, I can just look at these points and, and, and determine which machine. So all of this data will, will go to um, you know, um, machine one, all of this data will go to machine two, and all of this data will go to machine three. And this is the boundaries are not common across the machines, right? The boundaries may differ uh, on each machine. No, I send the same data to every machine, and then this sort step is going to be, I send to all machines, so all machines get the same set of data. The sort step is deterministic, so I'll select the same breakpoints in each machine. So okay. I'll, I'll get the same, the same, same breakpoints. So it, I was actually, I was actually implemented in the Hadoop implementation, and here they send it to one machine, and then they kind of cheated a little bit and send out um, these uh, these breakpoints to all machines, kind of through the master node, and kind of breaking the official rules of the dupe. But you can kind of do that a little bit. But if you send it to all the machines, then then you don't have to worry about that. It's not possible to send all the data to all machines. But I'm only sending a set of size k, which is going to be a lot smaller. So k is going to be small enough that I can send it. To I can send it from each node to all the machines. If we're, so, over, oh, if we're over sampling, how do we figure out which breakpoints to drop? So you you kind of you sort the breakpoints and then let's see, there's you can so you, you set I wrote this out explicitly, you set B J is going to be equal to the j of k over t. Um, 
So once I've sorted just the black points, I've said Bj to be J times the ceiling of K over T by it. So, so B0 is going to be this zeroth item, essentially. B1 is I'm going to do K over T ceiling. So this is an integer. Or maybe, yeah, J is an integer, right? So for, for, for 2, it's going to be the same factor times 2, right? So if, if so in this case, in, in this example, k over t ceiling is going to be equal to 3. And then... Oh, okay, that's a ceiling operator. Yes, yeah, so this is a ceiling. Yeah, ceiling operator. So then for b1, it's going to be 1 times 3. 1, 2, 3. b2 is going to be 2 times 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right? But you sampled those uh, black points? Those were sampled at random. That was that happened right here in in this step. So I with probability k over n, so I want to sample um, you know a roughly k points, because there are n things I'm gonna do this to, I send it to to all of the things and each of them are gonna sort it. Each of them are gonna do the same sort of uh, processing. So, so this is a very simple and fairly robust way in order to get uh, splits. So if you're doing, um, if you're doing IRA efficient uh, sorting this distribution sort, um, uh, then you can do this instead of trying to find the exact um, kind of the, the thing of exactly rank roughly k over t, um, um, or roughly rank k over n. You want this guy to be roughly ranked k over n instead of k over t. Um, maybe it was a uh, should be C. big n, small n, so the, the, the large large end, right? Right? Yeah. Maybe it's n over t. Sorry. So you want you want b j to be roughly j times n over t of the full data set. But instead, you're doing it just on the sample data set, and that'll give you an accurate estimate. Okay. So let's kind of let me try and explain at this point um, all the different parts of of why this is working. Okay. So the, the, there are a couple of things I, I need to uh, um, I need to convince you of, and I won't go through the full formal proofs, but I'll hopefully convince you that that these things are true by pointing, pointing to some like theorems that you can go look up if you want. So, um, so one thing we need is that um, the size of B is going to be um, basically K over two is gonna be less than it and it's, it's less than two times K. Right, so we say we want to sample them each independently. We don't. We can't do something like um, we can't do something like reservoir sampling um, because that would need to um, communicate across the different machines and the different splits. What is the reservoir? Sampling? The what? Reservoir sampling. So, so reservoir sampling was the streaming technique I talked about in one of the first lectures of the class for drawing a random sample from a stream. Right, and that is a very efficient way to do it in one pass over the data. But if we're doing it in a way that's distributed, we cannot communicate between the nodes. So we can't, we don't want to, what we don't want to do is, is do sample of the, some number from each um, node, um, from each individual node, because it, it could be that um, some of the nodes are biased. They have they have all their data, say, say right here. And so if you sample exactly the same number from each node, it may not work the same. This way, you can treat each, uh, actually, it, it might work, but this will be easier. You can process each of the key value pairs independently of all the other ones, right? You give them each the same probability you send it, and the total size will be roughly k. It'll be within a factor of two of k with, with high probability. So when I say with, WHP, 
What, what is big B again? B is the set of the large number of splits. It's all the circle black points. Okay. So big B are the set of all things that were sampled, all the sampled items. Okay. Can be big B, and and I want and I wanted to sample K of them, and I'm going to say I sampled roughly K of them with high probability. That means um, with probability greater than one minus one over n. Okay, and uh, I think I can do this on. I may need it to be 1 over k or something, but it's still going to be, well, let's, let's say 1. I, I think I can say this 1. So anyways, so as I mentioned uh, on Wednesday, there's this, you can use this central limit theorem. When you sample these, you're going to get roughly the, roughly the right number. So you can, you can prove this with, you know, um, technically you would use um, a Chernoff um, a turn off Hoffman bound, um, but you can probably, if you know the central limit theorem from statistics, you know that this should be pretty, um, pretty clear. Okay. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, okay, so now, um, then there are kind of two key properties that um, P1, I need that um, the size of B is going to be O of M and P2, I'm going to need that um, for all J that um, the, the set SJ, which is going to be all the elements in, in, in S such that E J minus one is less than S E J, and I want S J equals four. Okay. So, so basically, the second property said is that once I've designed these splitters, that I'm going to get um, O of M things between every pair. So I'm going to get I'm, I'm going to get a good split once I've designed these splits. Okay. So, so if these two things hold. I claim that this algorithm is it's easy, fairly easy to see that this is it's going to be a minimal map reduce algorithm. Okay, so if B is O of M, then the total traffic, the total amount of data I've sent, is is going to be um, I'm going to sample, you know, roughly um, um, k over t things per machine. And I send it to T, t machines. Um, so, so there are k things I'm going to sample. Roughly about one teeth of them are going to be on each of the T machines, and I'm going to send them out to T things, right? So I'm going to send roughly O of k elements from each machine, and if and the size of B was roughly O of k by this, and so that was O of M. So the first step, this first map step was okay. I only, by property two, I needed to send out only O of M things, and I only received O of M things because B was also O of K, which is O of M. Right, so I sent and received only O of M things, um, and then I can do, um, this sorting is going to take um, uh, M, M times log M time, and M is going to be N over T, and I'm doing this T different times. So the, the sorting is, is going to, I'm going to do T times M log M, and this is T times N over T log N over T, which is going to be um, less than or equal to N log because these cancel. Right, so the sorting in this step where I sort the B is going to be okay. And also because of property two, when I do the sorting down of each of these sets, these this sets uh, QJ, I guess I call that, I call this QJ down there so it's consistent. 
So when I sorted these QJs, these are also O of M. So again, the sorting is going to be less than N log N tau. Right? So this again, will, this will satisfy property four. And because of this, also I'm going to have O of M things on each of the reducers. So I'm going to satisfy the properties one and two. And it's clearly a constant number of rounds. There's no kind of for loop. Okay, so if I have both of these properties, I should be fine. Right, so um, I'm going to assume that K is O of M here. And if that holds, then, then this first property is going to hold by basically this turnoff Hopting value. The, the trickier part is this property two, right? That once I did this technique where I oversampled and I sorted and picked the best splitters from my sample, that this is that these are going to give me um, approximately even splits. So, so this is the thing that's a little trickier to show. Um, I'm going to I'm going to just describe how it works for the the this case of t squared um, using um, t squared log n. Um, so, yeah. Yep. If if by the property one. Uh, the each node has uh, of the order of O n uh, items. Like how can you calculate the boundary of all the items if uh, each node has only o order of m items? If only order of the boundary. So oh, so so each node has O of m. So in the in the, in the first round. Yes. Yeah. So so each node will have the same data on it, right? Yeah. It's the same data, so I'm going to do something deterministically. I'm going to have k, k things. k is going to be greater than t, so t is also going to be less than, less than m. k is going to be less than m, and t is less than k, so t is less than m. So I only need to come up with these t splitters. I need to do that on each machine. I have k of these data elements, or roughly k. I'm going to sort them. And then to choose the jth one, I'm going to do j times the ceiling of k over t in that sorted order. So in the sorted order of the black circle points here, I'm going to take bj to be the j times the, times the ceiling of k over t. And that'll tell me that split. Right? And you can, you can do this in a linear pass once you've sorted it. Right? Is it Oh, did that answer your question? Or did I, did I miss? I have some questions, but we can talk after this. Sure, OK. Um, right, so, so I'm actually debating whether I'm going to try and prove this. So let me, I'll spend just a couple minutes saying how you can prove the, the weaker bound. And then I'll talk about some other algorithms that you can do using this, this model and this once, you've, once you're able to sort. Um, OK, so, so there's, a, there's a result called an epsilon um, approximation. Um, and it's, it's that if you, um, if you sample 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta items, um, then if you um, and we'll, we'll call this set um, we'll call this set B. Then it, if I look at so so again B are the circle points and S are all of the original blue points, right? So the the full set. If I look at some some interval, and so an interval is going to look like. Um, it's going to be kind of a, an open, a half closed interval, so at some some boundary, and maybe this is the boundary of the two true, um, the optimal split point that, that I don't actually calculate. Um, that so so some interval i, then I look at the intersection of i over b, and I um, look at the difference, so the size of this intersection of i over s that the difference here is less than epsilon times the size of s. 
Okay, so if I sample roughly 1 over epsilon squared points, I'm going to have epsilon times S error on any kind of set. So basically, I want this to be the true thing. So I want that the, the guess I get from the, the, the points I've sampled is going to be close. So I want this to be roughly, so I want to set epsilon times S. So, so this is equal to epsilon N. I want to set this to be um, the amount of air I have, which is going to be uh, K over T. So, so this is on the order of the true gap between the points. And if this is true, um, set k over uh, I want it to be n over t over t then this is the gap I want between points I want to be roughly n over t points in each bucket I want so I want to have an epsilon n error here then this means that epsilon equals or 1 over epsilon is equal to t and I plug this into the size of the sample and I get t squared log 1 over delta. And this works with probability um, greater than 1 minus um, delta. So then I set 1 over delta to be 1 over n and I get this to work with, with this high probability. Is that a, okay. um, is it a log 1 over s or a log 1 over delta? 1 over delta. And this is the probability of this randomized algorithm field. Okay, so this was a very roughly, this is a high-powered technique. I'll probably mention it a little bit more detail in my data mining class next semester um, for, for analysis. But if you use this, you can get that, that, that um, the second larger amount. Okay. And, it, and that means that you have at most n over t error on each bucket, um, which means that the size of each of the sets QJ is still going to be roughly n over t. It's the true value is n over t, and I'll be off by roughly n over t, so it's still O of n over t, which is O of n. And from there, everything else will. OK, so maybe I skip some details, but I, I want to kind of show that sorting is kind of the core challenge. Once you can sort, you can solve a whole bunch of other problems, also being minimal map reduce algorithms. Right, so, so, so what is, um, so one of the other kind of problems we talked about before um, was subset um, sum, and, and that's where, where S is going to be an, an ordered um, set of elements so we can, so we can sort them, and, um, and uh, um, for each, S i and S, I have a this this weight, and then I want to compute W um, um, W i, and this is going to be um, the the sum of the weights of each S S um, uh, of each of the S i's where. Um, in the, so assume in the sort of order SI, so SJ equals, say J <laughs> equals 1 up to I, where SI is less than S, SI plus 1. So, so assume that the index gives me the true, the true sorted order here. All right, so then I want to calculate the weight of every subset going up to there. All right, so if, if I look back at this picture again, in each of these, had a weight of say one, then the, the the subset sum here would actually be the rank of this element. It says how many things, including um, are how, how many things are before it plus one for this element, right? And if they had weights, I'm actually getting some sort of uh, weight here. So so once I sort things, then I can in one more round I can compute all of these subset sum values, right? We talked about this parallel algorithm before, where it did this um, this split, where it broke things up into chunks, and then it, um, it it created the sum for each of the piece, and then it combined two, two pieces together, and then it expanded them back out again. Right. So 
Um, well, we can do this with the addition of one more round here. Um, what we're going to do is at, so also at, at the reducer number two, um, I'm also going to calculate, um, I'm going to call this weight, um, weight bar j to distinguish from, from this is going to be the sum over all the s in qj of all of these guys' weights. Right, so now when I sort, I also need to send all the weights. And so then create all the weight of all the elements in this, in this reducer. And so then I will also send um, for one, so I'm going to send this weight out to, to all of the, to, to, to all of the other reducers. So, so I'm going to send this out to so all the reducers. So now, when I look at, um, and then the map two will just send stuff. I'll essentially keep all the data on the same on the same reducers I had before, and then in the reducer number three, the first thing I'm going to do is if I'm on, um, let's call this on um, machine. J, then I actually I only need the first um, the first J weights. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that um, let's say that T J is going to be the sum over from I equals one to J of these weight J's bar, right? So I've gotten all the weights from all the things that were sorted before me, and I've summed up all of their weights, and then I'm going to um, so, so, so then for um, each S in um, QJ, and I'll, I'll do this in the sorted order. So I've got these already in sorted order. I'm going to scan over them, and I'm going to set, let's call this I. Um, I'm going to set weight I. Actually, I, I will set um, T j equals to um, tj plus weight i, and then I'll set weight i equals to tj. So I update these as I scan over, and then I set each of them to the weight. So at the start, this is the weight of everything that came before, and then I just scan over them and I update all of these. So I can do this subset sum now in three rounds, and this is still, still a minimal algorithm. So, further question about the sort algorithm. Would it be better to take it off point? Yeah, may, uh, maybe I'll describe one more thing you can do, and then we can okay. we can go back and discuss stuff after. The time is almost up. So, um, there's a slightly harder problem um, called the um, window sum, and here. I want no to relation to Mr. Davidson's flagship product. Uh, no, it's more of I want to for every if I have a bunch of elements, I want I specify a length L. So if this is element I, I'm going to look back at the L previous elements, and I want to do some sort of um, sum. So I I want W. Let's, let's call this something else. Let's call this gi is going to be j equals i minus l up to up to i of weight i. Right. So in, in the so, so like every hour we want to come up with the total number of packets that pass through our node or the previous in the last hour. hour. Right. So this is like I mentioned in the streaming section, this sliding window. Oh, the, okay. Where, oh, oh, do the windows overlap is what I'm trying to right, say. Right, yeah. So the windows overlap. So for every element, the window is going to be off by one. Right. So as I, in the streaming, as I was sliding along, I wanted to keep track of something for the last L elements. Now I'm, I'm not doing this streaming anymore. I'm solving the same problem offline. And I want to make it so it's one of these minimal map reduce algorithms. 
Okay, so, um, so and this can be any aggregate. Instead of the sum, it can be the max or the min, anything where I can kind of combine things together. So I'm going to use, so I need to use a, a slightly, so it's going to be very similar to the subset sum, but I somehow need to subtract off what happened before. And I don't want to send, you know, um, you know, I necessarily don't, don't necessarily want to send all of this data um, that, um, that I was using before. And if I was using, say, the max instead of the sum, I can't subtract off the max. Okay? So I, I somehow want to do something where I'm only aggregating things. I can't do any subtraction. So what I'm going to do instead here is at the reducer reducer 2, this, I'm going to send this wj bar equals to the, the aggregate, um, and this could be a sum or a max, so this could be a max that's set here, um, of all the, j, of all the, um, for all the s in qj, their, their weights. And then I'll sum, send this instead. And now instead of, um, and then in reducer 3, in, instead of computing um, this tj being the sum of all these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that, uh, um, say, xj is going to be, or is, is the, the aggregate of the set of, um, so it's essentially of, um, I'm at j, I want to go back j over k uh, minus l. So I want to go back l steps, and I want to aggregate only, um, I only want to aggregate the ones that are actually relevant. Right, so if I went back here, and this was broken up into different chunks here, um, then I, say that this is G7 and this is G6, then I want to add these, but I don't want to add the ones for my current chunk or for the last chunk in the end. So I also need to, at this step, I want to send things that are back the right number of chunks. And I need to make sure I send them to the right node. So I also need another step here where I send um, I send stuff to node, um, I send all the elements here to node uh, j plus like L over k. And I do this for all s and q j, right? And I send its weight as well. So I, I need to send all these chunks, all these elements forward so then I can scan over both of them and compute the right window. Um, so if I'm only sending them to one other thing, so I'm sending O of M things, but I'm sending them to one other machine. So no, every machine is going to have roughly twice as much data as it had before. Um, it's still O of M, so that's going to be OK. So I can still use asymptotically as many machines as I need and get the right asymptotic speed. Okay, so, so then I need to do this and I need to sum up the part here and here and this is going to be a sliding sum that I can update. I, I can update as well. Okay, there's some details to work out, but the, the, this was a problem that was kind of hard to figure out how to do in MapReduce before. But once you can do this in, uh, figure out how to do the sorting and these splits, then, then this also falls in the same set of techniques. Delta, you have phi equals and then So this is zero. J to uh, I to J um, minus one. So I want to so do I, J, I, see, this is, sorry, this should be J times K L. So I want to go back some number of chunks and just add up these that fit entirely inside the window. Okay, so it's J L over K. So sorry, this should be 
I, I think it's it's in my notes if you want to look at at there, but I think it's J times K. Uh, that's to be the size of the should be T. I'm sorry about this. This should be N over T minus L over N over T. This should probably be a minus longer. So th this picture is a better better way of describing. I can write out this these indexes until you don't understand what they mean anymore anyways. Um, but think of there's a window and you know there are so many entire chunks. And then I'm also going to send, when I want to calculate the aggregates here, I need to get all of the data that was in this chunk, which overlapped with the end of the window. It overlapped with the end of the window. I need to send this data, this data forward onto this machine here. And so that's what this step is also doing. I'm sending it forward onto the right machine. So then I have all this information, all this information, and the aggregates of everything in between. And from that, and in linear time, I can sweep over and compute all these, all these window sums. So it's the, the, the key issue is the transfer of the right data without transferring too much data. You don't want to have to replicate things too many times. And so, so that's kind of the key to, to, how, to how this can work. All right, so sorry, this wasn't explained all that well. If you, um, if you look in the notes, it's, I've written out some more of the detail that I didn't want to try and jam into, even worse into this page. And, and the paper, I linked to the paper, it's a really readable paper. Um, so if you're interested in these things, it's a, probably a pretty nice paper to read. Okay, so. Um, this is the end of the, of the MapReduce part of the class. Um, so, and, and I went over time for the class. So, feel free to ask me any questions about sorting or anything. Okay. Um, with the sort algorithm, uh, what happens if our data size is so big that the amount of data that would be allocated to any one of our processors exceeds its uh, memory or disk capacity. Well, then that means that you cannot fit your data on your current hard drive. So, so where is the data? I, I'm assuming it's on some storage array, uh, maybe out on the internet or something. So when you build these clusters, you uh, you you build them so every every hard drive is connected to some processor. That's, they're built with these commodity machines, so if you can store the data, it fits there. Now, the difference here is you want the data to be in memory, not just on disk, right? So you want all, all of your data to fit on the memory across all the machines you have, so you don't have to worry about the paging and running IO efficient algorithms inside of the, the map and reduce uh, columns. Uh, so you want to fit in the memory. If it doesn't fit in the memory on that main machine, Either you need more memory per machines, or you need more machines. Okay. And you talk to when you talk to these companies, they're like, if that happens, if it's a really important process for the for the company, they will go buy more machines. So that's their solution. Okay. And that's what Google says. If if you want to, you know, if it's running too slow, we're going to run it on more machines. Right. And the important thing about these minimal algorithms is that. You know, t is a parameter, and this runs for any parameter t. The larger the more machines you have, the less memory you need per machine. Okay. Okay. So, so it's not like there's some simple adaptation of the algorithm that we. Well, th there there may be some some problems that come up, and then you're going to need to use IO efficient algorithms. Right. So the first section of the class, we talked about those, then you're going to need to appeal to those techniques if you need to page stuff from disk. You want to bring stuff from disk as seldom as possible. So like a one-pass algorithm of the data would probably only pull it from disk once, and that would be as good as you can do. But um, it's, it's advisable to try and run your map reduced algorithms without having to write intermediate things onto the disk at the reducer speed. And so if you do that, it'll probably slow down. So 
you should try and you know, use one of these designs to reduce the amount of data needed on each machine. So the point of studying the algorithms associated with MapReduce instead of just looking at how you use the system is so that you can avoid these sort of scenarios where you try and send too much data to one machine that you need to put stuff on disk. You want to avoid having to use all these I.O. efficient algorithms that we talked about. Because I guess if you're in, in databases, you know they're a little bit painful to actually code sometimes. Right? Um, you can do it, but uh, it's easier to just work within RAM. All right, well, I'll see you next week, and we'll talk about GPU.